Welcome to the podcast of Revival Life Church, a spirit-filled multicultural church in Boca Raton, Florida. If you would like more information about Revival Life Church or Pastor Carl Thomas, you can find us on the web at revivallife.church. The Spirit of God. Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is comfortable, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're in our message series, Supernatural Connection. And uh, thank you. And uh, we started this message series um, with our connection collectively to God as the body of Christ. And since we are the temple of Holy Spirit, we talked about how we are supernaturally empowered to minister to one another like Titus ministered to Paul. But also, Jesus used this supernatural empowerment to give us a new measuring stick. Jesus decided that our greatness was not going to be compared to one another's ability, but our ability to serve one another. I don't want you to be distracted by God touching Chris up here. I want you to feel jealous And um, and uh, God is doing something deep. You know, he missed a Sunday, and so God had to give him a double dose the next Sunday. That's how God does it sometimes. It's a holy moment that we've just had, and uh, I don't want to. I don't want to rush past it. Um, there's a there's there's something very special about being in a church that um, isn't a slave to a time schedule, that isn't a slave to a a, a, a set schedule that, you know, at 27 past the hour, we have to be at this point of the service where we can allow God to be God. Can you say, man, are you thankful? Are you thankful we get in a place where God can just be God? I am thankful that God is a very, very good God. And then he touches us in a very good way. And this is this is. This series that we're talking about, this supernatural connection. <clears throat> Many times when we talk about our connection to God, especially in the West, we talk about my personal relationship with Jesus. And when we talk about evangelism, uh, we oftentimes tell people that, have you made a personal decision for Christ? Have you personally been saved? One person in the Bible is like the church and this personal. And, and there is this collective part of the body of Christ that we neglect. And there is the sovereignty of God that we also neglect. In the church's desire to be a personal um, uh, encounter for each individual person, we forget that the collective is super important to God. The people of God have never been an individual. It has always been a collective. When God called Abraham, he talked about the many, many, many generations that would come after him that he represented. It wasn't just Abraham. It was the people that he would represent. And in fact, he would bless the people of the whole earth. He didn't call a disciple. He called the disciples. He didn't call us individually. He called us collectively. Why do I tell us this? Because once you understand that there is both an anointing on you for other people and an anointing on other people for you, you begin to recognize that when I am weak, God has had somebody I am connected to praying for me, that I am not out here walking this walk out on my own. I'm walking it out as the people of God. I am connected to people and I find great comfort in that. And the older I get and the, the stronger I am in the Lord, the more I recognize that I desperately need other 
people in my life pouring into me, loving me, uh, caring about me, interceding for me. Uh, we had a great little time this last week. Um, uh, Duke uh, turned, he's had a birthday. I didn't announce it last week. I think, amen, amen, 45, is that right? Some, 45, something like 48, something like that. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I think he's 27, right? You like that better? 27. He's somewhere between 27 and 45. And uh, we hung out, had a, had a, had a, had a time uh, at his house. And, um, and, uh, and I just, I love being connected to people uh, in a way that is supernatural. Um, and and, and uh, that was your present on the seat there. You put it back. That, yeah, that was your, yeah. I forgot it last week, so I put it on your seat. And, and, since we're, and since we're talking about random stuff here, yeah, it, yeah, but it's yours. Here, give it to him, honey. Go ahead, give it to him. It's a, yeah. No, it's, you're not going to open it. Yeah. I mean, you can open it if you want, but it's not that exciting. Uh, it's exciting to me. Go ahead and open it. Let me, it's family here. <laughs> Now, this is, this, is, this is the kind of birthday gifts that Pastor Carl gets right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just open it right now. <clears throat> it's underwear. No. <clears throat> it's, no it's, not a, it's not a commentary Bible. It's not a Bible. It is a commentary of the whole Bible. Of the, that's the kind of gifts you get from Pastor Carl. If you love the word, you get, you get commentaries. I use that commentary all the time. It's, it's really good, and your wife will probably like it a bunch too, and I thought of her when I, when I got it. The other thing, since we're just talking about stuff, right? I have a phone. Do you have a phone? Do you know where your phone is? I don't know where mine is. It's somewhere in this building. It's red, and it's somewhere around here. So, you know, uh, if it starts making noise, you know, there, there it is. I had it during uh, practice, and now I don't know where it is. If you're watching us online, you're like, what the heck is going on at this church? <laughs> Worship went for I don't know how long. Pastor's talking about his phone. Welcome home, right? This is, this is who we are. We're just people. We're people. Come see it live. It's, it's, it's not any more organized live, right? But when we go live, watch out. It's going to be amazing. <clears throat> Here's the challenge that we have as Christians. And it's a challenge that's um, infecting the American church. And unfortunately, we're not treating it at all because it's become no longer a bug. It's become a feature. And that feature is that um, they're selling a, a, a version of Christianity that is neither biblical nor true. And it sets us up for great heart hurt. OK, what happened this morning? What happened is uh, some people uh, were in touch with their pain in a way that was real. But at the same point, God was letting people know, I do see your pain and I care about it. And I want to lead you into something even better. Notice, though, when God says, I want to lead you to something better, he's not necessarily saying something less painful. Have you ever noticed that about God? If we're going to worship the real God, we have to see him rightly. And, and, and we don't see God well when we think God's desire is that he would empower me to receive my desire. <clears throat> Let me say that again. Uh, us charismatics, Pentecostals, unfortunately fall into this trap that we believe the theology of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But somehow when we get to God the Son, Jesus is the Son who checked out and is, is gone off to heaven. And he's not really concerned about what's happening here. And God the Holy Spirit isn't as much God today as he is just a, a force that I use to get what I want to have happen, happen. And, 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 and I, the anointed man of God, right? All of a sudden, I am Jesus' replacement on the earth. And we have this low, what's called a low Christology, where we don't believe that Jesus is actually in control running things. We believe that I'm actually running things. He put me in charge, and I'm the one running things. And the Holy Spirit is kind of like my vice president. And the vice president doesn't do anything unless the president asks him to. And he doesn't have the authority to override the president. So we get these really weird teachings in charismatic Christianity today about the authority of the apostles. And I heard a guy who's a widely considered apostle talking about how Jesus does certain things to fulfill the words of people because he doesn't want them to be fallible. And it just it gets super, super weird in the in the real. Hear me. Why you bring this up, Pastor? The problem is, if we don't see God rightly, we don't get what he really has for us because we're busy looking for him to be somebody he's not. 
And so then we get disappointed that this God that they promised us didn't come through, who wasn't the true God anyway. And, and here's what's even more sad. What God actually has is exceedingly abundantly better than beyond what we could ask or think. And if we don't recognize that if he's exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine, that we can't imagine the blessing he has for us. That means we don't, hasn't even entered into the hearts of men what God actually has for us. That means what you have planned for the future is probably not what God has because you can't imagine what he has. And it's in that surrendering to God that we actually open ourselves up to the blessing that we can't imagine. As long as we have to get what we are asking for in our relationship with Jesus surrounds what we've already come up with, we'll never come to the knowledge of the true God because we're worshiping the God that we created. Is this, too, is this, is this making sense? I, is, is this, I, this isn't in my message. I'm just kind of sharing what's in my heart here for a moment. <clears throat> and um, um, it'll be on the website. Um, every Sunday after service, I write um, a recap of the message. And then I give a couple things that you can think about uh, as you uh, consider the message during the week. I send it out in an email newsletter. If you're not getting the email newsletter, um, fill out a connection card. We'll, hopefully, it'll sign you up. Uh, if not, it's on the website. The message is always on the website by Sunday afternoon along with these things that you can consider. It also has the video and the podcast that you can subscribe to because as a people, we're not just here to entertain on Sunday. We're here to see transformation in South Florida. We want to see people become disciples of the real, true, living God. This, this, is, this is what we want. And sometimes when we think about um, growth in Christ, when we start thinking about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, we, we think in terms of how the world has discipled us. And I've been hitting this a lot. You might get tired of hearing it. But I, I, I don't run out of ways to show you that the world is telling us how to behave instead of us being formed by Jesus. Right. And, and so many of us, spiritual growth looks like this. Up and to the right. And I'm powerful. I'm big and powerful. Uh, OK, he looks more like me than most of you. Uh, but that's irrelevant. Uh, just imagine he looks like you. Uh, uh, uh. And everything in Christ not only gets bigger and better, but I am strong. The opposite of what Paul said about his growth in Christ, right? Like that is his weakness that he's glorying, right? Now, now for, if you're like me, my walk was something like this. It looked like it was going good. And then I was like, where, where is it actually going? Uh, went down for a minute. Uh, then it started going up. Uh, and, and, and I don't necessarily know what the numbers represent, right? I don't, I don't, I don't know, but I think I'm going in the right direction, right? Uh, there's someone in this room who knows what that means, and it's not me, right? Like that's, that, that, and so that's kind of, kind of been mine. Now you, you might be like, my, my walk looks a little more like this. I'm in the game. I don't know what position I'm playing, but I, I think I'm on the team and hopefully I'm on the right team, right? Like that's, it's, I don't know what, who's doing what and where I am on this board, but I got to believe that God has a plan and, and, and I'm in the plan somewhere. Now somebody knows what, um. Is that a jet sweep? What is that? What, what is that play? You got an idea? What is that? What, what, what would you call that? Well, it is a football play, yes, but there's a name. What, what, would you, what, would you, what would you call that? Kareem, what would you say? Maybe a jet sweep? What would you call it? A wing T there. See, somebody knows what this means. You got a T formation. You got a full back, right? You got a, you got a, you're doing a, okay, he's doing a, right. See, so, so, so then you'll be like, I don't, I don't know. And so like, he's God, the Holy Spirit who sees the plan who that's happening. And you're like, I don't, I don't know. Hopefully some, hopefully the coach who drew this up has a plan for this play. And, and, and many people, this is more like your Christianity. I don't tell me at the end of the game, if we won or not. <laughs> right. You might go to a party and you're just going to yell when other people yell. Yeah, we. We did a football, right? Like that's, I don't, right? And, and, and this is, this is unfortunately what, what we've kind of been, we've kind of been trained that everything in our life, we should be able to measure it. And we don't unfortunately measure the way God measures things. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk briefly. I wasn't sure why God gave me a shorter message today. And now I understand because he wanted to do something. And then we're going to share the Lord's table at the end of the service. But 
when God was looking for the next king of Israel, I find this super interesting that God had to tell the prophet what to look for. And, 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 and the prophet was looking for the next king of Israel. And he had to say, listen, you're going to look for someone tall and strong, but I don't judge the way you judge things. Now, think about the, the seriousness of this. It wasn't like today where everybody can call themselves a prophet and they can ha- get every prophecy wrong and people still call them prophets, right? There's people today who haven't, who haven't said a, a correct prophecy in 20 years and they've gotten so bad that I like now comment on their prophecies and I say, if you actually believe this is a prophet, please come talk to me because you have not read your Bible in as long as this man has been ministering. Because they're, 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 like, they haven't gotten up, like they, they can't even prophesy the sun rising in the morning, right? Like they, they, that's how far off they are. Like, why anybody would call this a prophet, I don't understand. And, and, but these, in those days, like there was one prophet and if you got it wrong, you die. Like that's it. And, and it's not an easy death like today. Like they hit you with rocks until your brain swells and kills you. Like, that's a terrible way to die. And that's like, are you sure you want to prophesy? You're like, yeah, no, probably not. I'm I'm good. We'll just read the ones that were already written, right? And, and, and And so God had to tell this guy, listen, we're going to pick out the next king, but I don't judge the way you judge. I judge very differently than you. I, I, I don't look at outward appearances. I look at the heart. And, and so many times in our Christianity, we're viewing the outward uh, growth, the ways, these tangible, quantifiable ways that we could grow instead of really seeing, am I experiencing heart transformation? You, are you hearing me? The way of the world does not produce the fruit of the Spirit. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit is at war with the flesh. And so if the Spirit is at war with the flesh, why would we judge our relationship with God based on our flesh or what our flesh is doing? We have to come in with a new measurement. And so in the, um, in, in the attempt of making things over simple, uh, I, I, came, I, I found this, um, what I call the Christian Greatness Index. The Christian Greatness Index. Now, this was um, written originally by a very famous theologian, uh, Carl Thomas. Um, <laughs> And I just want to just kind of briefly help you kind of figure out where am I in my in my growth with Jesus, in my walk with God. Let me let me figure out on the index. Where am I now? If we're going to have an index, unfortunately, we uh, will look at other people and try to figure out where they're on the index. Right. Like that's that's human nature right here. And so I'm going to give you a couple milestones to try to maybe figure out where you're at. If you were to look at this index, you would think where Where am I? You're like, well, five is the least and one is the greatest. And most of us, nobody's going to say I'm number one. Well, it depends on who's five, who's one. I don't know. So we'll start out right here. Judas Iscariot, number five, right? Okay, so he's like, I'm not where I need to be, but I'm probably better than him, right? I'm better, better than Judas Iscariot. Here's what's interesting about Judas Iscariot. If you read the New Testament, he's the only disciple that they give his last name. They want to make sure you know who this is. We're going to make sure that you know the Judas I'm talking about. Like when, 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 the, when, the, when the apostles were doing church discipline and they modeled church discipline, they were very serious about you knowing who exactly tried to destroy the church. They called them out. Later, Paul talks about, hey, you got to do this. If there's an elder that's caught in sin, go to him, go to with two. If he refuses to repent, you have to rebuke publicly that others, the Bible says, may fear. Right? And, and, and Judah, this, you don't want your last name mentioned in the New Testament. That's what that tells me. Right? I don't mind it being vague. I don't mind it not sure which Carl you're talking about. Right? That's okay. If they know exactly who I am, it could be a bad sign. Right? And so we say, okay, if he's, if he's, if he's one, if he's, if he's five, then who's going to be one? Well, we'll put Jesus, son of God, son of man, right? I'm not, I'm better than Judas, but yeah, okay, Jesus is better than me, right? Like he's probably greater than I am, right? And so I'm probably somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah, we would hope. Now, if you're not a believer in Christ, you're not even on the scale right now. You're like somewhere, you're like in another book somewhere, right? We want to move you into the book of life. That's our goal here in Revival Life Church, to call people to become disciples 
and they, you get on the book of life, right? This is what we want uh, right here. So, but we're somewhere in between, right? And, and, and what I'm going to do today, and I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, I'm going to show what I consider to be three stages as it pertains to allowing our connection to Jesus and uh, his body to shape our lives, this is what we're doing, all right? This, this, and I'm going to call it stages. And, and I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I think it's somewhat, uh, somewhat helpful. So, so here we are. We start in our relationship with Jesus, and we find out that, that, that God is God and, and I'm not, right? For most people, this is, this is a pretty big revelation right here, that I, I am not the end-all, be-all uh, of, of, of all Christianity, that I don't get to decide everything in my life. And and in our scripture this morning, Jesus says this. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Well, there's this time that we recognize that Jesus died on a cross for me, and he's greater than me, and and we get on this, this scale. And I would call this first step, we come under what we consider the new law. We lived according to our own passions, according to our own judgment on what we thought was right and what we thought was wrong. And mostly what we thought was right and wrong is what actually benefits me the most. And we don't do things that are wrong because of the harm that will come to our lives. And we do things that are right because of the benefit that comes to our lives. And so I, I consider this, 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 kinda, this stage right here, when we're under the new law, you are the obedient follower. I don't know a lot about God, but I understand there's some things and I need to do those things. Like I said in the scripture, he said, come to me, all who are weary. And so Jesus said, come to me and I'm an obedient follower. So I have to come to Jesus. I give my life to him. He died on a cross for me. I now recognize that and I need to be obedient. Jesus said our first act of obedience is we get water baptized. So maybe you've been saved for a little bit and it's time for you to get water baptized and and, and, and we're having a class coming up. You want to sign up for that so you can start your new life in Christ. And we recognize that I have choices and, and it's my choice to be an obedient follower of Jesus. And in this season, if you're in the season, it's a beautiful season because we start reading the Bible. We come to church and we start learning some things. We understand that there's rules in this kingdom. We find out that Jesus wasn't just giving suggestions that he actually is God, the Son, and God, the Son, was speaking a new life and a new kingdom to us. I've been studying the early church, and we have a writing called the Didache, which is the kind of the ten sayings of discipleship, and it was written in the first century. And in the Didache, um, they talk about making disciples, and when an unbeliever decides to become a Christian, what they would do is it was about a three-year process before they would water baptize you and in the first year they teach you that you have to begin living a moral life you begin treating people well you don't rob people you don't lie Um, there was a sexual ethic that was very odd to the world in the roman world in the greek world at the time christians were known and we have writings from those days of non-believers christians were considered odd and they were unusual because they reserved sexual intercourse for marriage Uh, You didn't have sex with your concubines. You didn't visit prostitutes, which was very common then. They had one wife, whereas it was very common. If you have more money, you just have more sexual partners. And they said, listen, for the next year, just start living a moral life. And after a year, you know, you can be hearing us and being discipled, whatever. But just let's just see if you're willing to be moral. Hear me. This is before they got water baptized before they got converted, before they got the Holy Ghost. This wasn't like, God, help me stop having sex with my neighbor. No, no, just stop, right? Like, you can do this. You actually, it's not that difficult, just stop, right? And so there's, 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 there's these rules in living in the kingdom. And we find out that, you know, you're reading the Bible and you stumble on Matthew chapter 6 and we see things that Jesus says like, like, like when you pray, when you fast, when you give, he didn't say if. Jesus didn't say, you know, if, if, you know, you just decide you need more, you know, that, you know, if, if you decide to pray, here's a suggestion. on how, No, no, he says, when you pray, pray this way. When you fast, fast this way. When you give, not nah, if you feel generous and you got a little bonus at work and you decide, ah, 
I might go ahead and spend this on booze, but I'll give God a tip at the end of the week here. No, no. When you give, we find out in the kingdom there are some expectations with our lives to pray and fast and be faithful in our finances. In Hebrews, you read, it says, when you gather, don't neglect coming to church. Don't neglect the gathering together of the saints because you have a part to play there. We gather together in worship and the world worships itself, but we as Christians decide that we are worshiping God and we come and we sing songs with our heart as one people. We connect to other people. And in this connecting, we begin to know God and we begin to know others. And in the midst of that, we begin to truly know ourselves and we begin to serve the people of God. We feel if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ and you're in this obedient follower phase there's going to be a pull on your heart that i need to begin serving the people of god and serving the world as a body of christ if we're all obedient to the spirit we serve one another and everybody's need gets met this is what the church is supposed to look like to serve in the house of god to serve your neighbor by telling them the good news to serve the lost by letting them know you don't have to stay lost there's a place where you can come and Encounter the living God. Be taught the word. Encounter the spirit. Let him begin to heal your heart from the wounds of this world. Telling them about your relationship with Jesus. There's just a way that we serve because we are obedient followers. But we don't, we don't, we don't stay there. We begin to grow and, and uh, we expect to grow in Christ. I think as believers, I'm, I'm a learner in my um, personality tests. I'm a learner. I like to learn all the things, right? So I don't, my wife likes to say, I don't dabble in things. I know everything about something or I know nothing about it. I know a little bit about a whole lot of stuff because I know the things. I, I, that's what I do. And so when I got saved, when I became a Christian, I just began devouring the word of God. I began devouring church history. I began devouring uh, evangelism and discipleship and, and learning of God and praying and being in his presence because I wanted to know all the things. And my question was, how, how, do, I, how do I get advanced in this thing? How do I get promotion? How do I, and, and God in this being obedient servant had to start working in my heart that, that that's not the goal of this stuff. And so we move in this phase as we're maturing from just being uh, under a new law and being obedient followers. And we move into a season that, that I call there's a new goal. You used to live under a new law when you get saved. God is telling me how I'm supposed to do things. And when we're in that, in, in that season of the law of, as a new believer, we're just pray things like, God, just tell me what I'm supposed to do. Tell me where I'm supposed to go to school. Tell me where I'm supposed to work. Tell me how you want me to do things. I just want you to tell me. But if we live with God enough, that starts to fall by the wayside. Because he doesn't tell us exactly what we're supposed to do. He starts changing our ethos. And he changes the goal line. Instead of just being a good robot, we start living in a way that we say, wait a minute, I, I have new goals for my life. Let's look at our, our scripture again that we're studying this morning. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I find this just so comforting that Jesus says, learn from me. Learn from me. What does that mean? I mean, I, I, I read this book every day. I try to memorize it. I try to know all the things about it. But Jesus did not save me to have a relationship with this book. This book helps me have a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus didn't say learn about me. He said learn from me. And I got to tell you, there is a shift that happens in the mind of a believer when you recognize that I am not just here to be God's soldier. He actually calls me friend. And friends talk to friends. 
You, you say my friendship isn't, isn't that strong these days because we don't talk that much. But friends talk. And when you move into this new season from being just under the law to being, having the goals of your life shift, we ask better questions. Instead of asking exactly what am I supposed to do, we start asking things like, what would this look like, God, if it worked out the way you wanted? We get new goals. He helps shape God-glorifying, God-honoring goals in our lives. And we start saying, instead of me being up and to the right, the most successful one on the planet, the one with the most gifts who can do the most miracles and do the most spiritual tricks, all of a sudden Jesus said, learn from me for I am gentle and humble. Well, there's a goal. That's the goal that many men in America should embrace. Gentle and humble. We're coming into election season. You're going to hear a lot of people claiming to represent Jesus who are going to look the opposite of this and say that they have been sent by God. But if you do not look gentle and you are not humble, you have not been sent by God to lead anything. You are still under the law portion, wanting to put other people under your laws. Jesus said, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble. And so instead of being under the law, I call this the new goal, an observant disciple. In this season, we begin to look at Jesus. We begin to spend time contemplating the risen Christ. This is, this is, this is a discipline. This takes time. This, this takes energy. This, this takes us actually carving some time out of our life to say, I am going to just sit and be quiet and look at Jesus. I'm going to read my Bible. Here's how I like to do this. Good Jesus. <laughs> <I'm> go <laughs> Mike is scaring me back there. If Mike is yelling, Lord, help, I don't know. Hopefully somebody's CPR approved. I don't, I don't know what's going on. But uh, that's a joke. No, no, no. Um, here's how I like to do this. I like to start the morning, and I like to open the psalm of the day, and I pray through the psalm, and I be quiet, and I look at Jesus. I pray that the heart of God is revealed to me so that I can see Jesus rightly. We're not working toward a goal any longer. I'm not doing a checklist. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not reading the Bible to check off an informational list. I'm, I'm, I'm studying the Scriptures so I can see what Jesus is like, how He moved, how, how He operated with his disciples and how he operated with people. There's a lot of people today who say things like there's people sitting at tables that Jesus would have flipped trying to tell us that we should be flipping tables, but you'll never see a place in scripture where Jesus congratu congratulated anybody or affirmed anybody who did anything with violence. There's no place in the scripture where somebody did something violent and Jesus said, good job. He constantly challenged his disciples to be meek and humble. If there's tables that need to be flipped, Jesus will flip them. Has anybody experienced that? <laughs> Jesus will flip all the tables that he wants flipped. In this season, you might come upon scriptures like Matthew chapter 5, where we see the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says things like, hey, you heard it say don't murder, but I tell you, don't even be angry. Uh, you've heard it say that don't commit adultery, but I tell you, you shouldn't even lust. You've heard it said, hey, if someone does something wrong to you, you get them back eye for an eye. But I tell you, turn the other cheek. In this, we understand, whoa, whoa, whoa there's, there's something going on here. There's new goals for my life. Uh, I, Jesus is wanting me to not just follow rules. There's a heart transformation that I'm going through as a believer that changes how I move in this world. What goals look like, where, where I'm going, where I'm moving, what is supposed to be happening and being produced from my life. There's this inner transformation that needs to happen. I wish it was a checklist under the new law it just sounds easy because we, unfortunately, since we're not under the law, when we live as legalistic Christians, we get to pick the laws that we stay under. Have you noticed that? 
the people who are the most legalistic believe in the laws that they're the best at keeping. And where Jesus says, actually, I'll put my finger on whatever I want in your life. And we're going to work on that in this season. Has anybody experienced that? And you're like, God, let's, can we talk about this thing that I'm doing really good at? He's like, oh, yeah, that's great and all, but let's talk about this. This is the real Jesus. We see that laws were good, but God actually has something better. Here's how Jesus said it. He says, I am the door. No, that's not the scripture. He says, I am the door. Oh, we got it there. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so when you go from law to goal, and you come across scriptures like this, that Jesus came that I may have life and have it abundantly, we start thinking, how do I need to set up my life so I can live in what Jesus calls life? Abundant life. This is a new goal that I want to live in. This is where I'm at in my life. I want to live whatever Jesus calls abundance. This is, this is what I desperately want. I desperately want to live what Jesus calls flourishing. He actually created us for a purpose. And the world comes and gives us a new purpose. The world tells us our purpose is to just have a little bit more than the people around us. That's called flourishing. And Jesus is like, I have a flourishing for you that is not even comparable to the people around you. As a matter of fact, what I call flourishing, you got to just do it, Jacory. Just do it. You can't do it for five minutes. Just open it. Just thank you. <laughs> what Jesus calls flourishing Is, is unable to be calculated through our natural means of measurement. There's no graph for it. It's, it's like the football play. I got everybody's doing everything, and your success is dependent upon you doing what I've asked you to do. It, it, whether it be in a, in a ballet or in a football game, if one person is doing their own thing, it doesn't work. If our worship team practices all week, and they come up here, and Courtney decides, you know, those songs are good, but I would rather sing this other song because it's ministering to me. And I understand you're all going to be singing holy, but I'm going to be singing uh, this other song, A Good, Good Father, because that's the season I'm in. All of a sudden, the worship doesn't work because one person is not actually following the leadership and they're doing their own thing. This is how it's like in our lives. When God the Father, who by His Spirit lives on the inside of us through the open door of Jesus Christ, who baptizes us in the Spirit, when we're all obedient to God, all of a sudden we're singing a chorus on earth that only God hears in perfect unity. But at the same time, our lives are producing a fruit that we could not produce on our own. Is this making sense? But it has to come from you coming from a place of understanding. Man, God's working on levels I don't see. And even in what I'm struggling in, Jesus is in. Jesus is in the midst of the places that I think are dry. I, um, I want to encourage those of you who feel like you're in a dry place. You know, the saying goes that testing happens when the teacher is quiet. And you might be like, why am I not hearing God in this hard season? Because you've been taught what you needed for this season. And God is allowing the test to happen for you to see that you've mastered and ready to move on to the next season. It's final season right now for those in college and in high school. I imagine it's coming up. And in final season, you don't get more lessons. You get to relive the lessons you've learned so you can move on to the next course. And so some of us are like, God, why aren't you talking? He's like, I have been. That's why you might want to journal a little bit when God is talking. Because it's hard to study for finals with no notes. Wow. 
might, 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 you know, might want to spend time with God with a pen and paper and just act like what he says is important enough to write down, right? Right? Because the test is coming. And uh, I don't know about you, I don't like taking the same course twice. Because you've got to pay for it every time. And it's far less interesting the second and third time. Am I right? So we've got to finish well. We've got to let Jesus do what he's doing in our lives. And we've got to finish well so we move on to the next season. I, I'm going to move on. I've got things I would say there. But I, just, I, just, I pray that that would minister to you. Don't brag that you've been in the same season for 10 years. So don't, don't brag about you. Oh, I've been doing that. Well, I'm just like, well, maybe you should, I don't know. Meet with somebody and figure out why you're still there, right? Like, talk to someone and maybe, maybe, maybe God has you. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to counsel from the stage because each person is different, but God wants to move you forward. And so he, we start recognizing, man, there is an abundant life that God has for you. But if you don't value the abundance, it doesn't matter. There's a famous story now. I, I, I believe that, that, cryptocurrency. Don't, don't get offended. It's all going to collapse at some point. Don't get offended. If you've got your whole savings in it, that's between you and Jesus. I don't know. It's all going to collapse at some point. But there was a moment that people thought it was worthless. Bitcoin, you've heard of, right? Even if you don't invest in it. And, and people were amassing these Bitcoins. And at some point, someone did the first Bitcoin transaction. They bought a pizza. Do you know this is a famous story? For 10,000 Bitcoin. Now, how much is a Bitcoin right now? $65,000 each? That's like the most expensive meal ever purchased in today's Bitcoin. But back then it wasn't valuable, so nobody held on to it. The guy who bought, who, who sold the pizza for the Bitcoin, he didn't even keep them. He's like, I don't even know what to do with this, and it's gone. Like, they didn't know what, what to value. Hear, hear what I'm saying in all of this. If we don't know what God values, we don't understand when he's giving us a fortune because we're, we're viewing it by the world's standards. We don't recognize this word he's given us that we think, oh, God, you're so silly talking about things that don't matter. He's like, this is the key to your whole next season. You might want to pay attention right now. Does this make sense? And so by the spirit, we have to be attentive with the Holy Ghost is speaking to us. So we have that valuable peace that will unlock our next season. We're looking at it. We're paying attention to it. We're faithful in the word so God could speak to us. So we're not stuck in a season that God is trying to get us out of because he didn't give us the key three months ago, but we didn't value it enough. He tells you, hey, you might want to hold on to this Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin isn't going to work. You know, next thing you know, you could have been a billionaire. I know a pastor in, um, in Toronto who had a guy in his congregation that he told him this Bitcoin thing isn't going to work out. And then it blew up and the guy was smart enough to sell and he donated $5 million to their church network because he listened he felt a leading to get into this i wish i would have i don't know about you but i could use five million dollars right now i feel like that would help out a little bit i know that money can't buy happiness it could buy a little though right i mean it could buy a little happiness not not true happiness but i'm willing to see what five million dollars worth of happiness is i don't know about you i'm willing to test that axiom a little bit right um but what does God have for us? I hear, and, here's what I'm, and here's what I'm saying as we, as we mature in this next season, in this, what I consider this third season is the new life. We went from a, a, a new law, and then we had some new goals, and then we get to a place of maturity that we realize, I'm not actually going anywhere. I'm living a life in the kingdom that Jesus has for me. And this is God's desire. In this new life, I live in abundant living. Now, I have, I have, it's been my experience that when we hit this season, we start getting prosperity in every area of our lives. You, you may not be rich, as the world calls it rich, but somehow finances just work out. That's no longer a fear, right? Relationships are no longer a fear. Employment is no longer a fear because we're living in abundance. But we have to, we have to ask ourselves, how do I define the good life? And Jesus said, the way you get this is you take his yoke. Now, now I'm going to do a little anthropological education, and then we're going to have the Lord's table here. So Jesus said, take my yoke, but that's hard for us to understand. Now, most of us, when we think of a yoke, we think, oops, we think of this. Now, the two ox are held together by what's called 
a yoke, right? And so they share the load in pulling this. And unfortunately, when we think about take my yoke, we think about this and Jesus wants, and then we start thinking, okay, it's me and Jesus pulling the load. And I don't know um, if you look at this, but it should strike you that I, uh, Jesus is doing half the work and I'm, I'm doing half the work. That, that's like... That's like me and a professional bodybuilder carrying a fridge. He's doing all the work, and I look like I'm helping. Like that's, that's how that would work out. So this is, this is not what God is talking about. God is not talking about, I'm going to be yoked to you, and you're going to be yoked to me, and you're going to take this because my, bur- my burden is light. That's, that's not what it looks like. Here's actually what it means. A yoke is it's a one-person device where it makes carrying weight easier. If you're to carry two pots of water like this, it's hard. It's a lot of work. It sloshes around. It's hard to keep your arms out. It's hard to move it. But somehow when you get this yoke, you could carry so much more than you ever could have on your own. Just just the physics of having it rest on your shoulder, all of a sudden, the load is easy. This is... (laughs) The yoke of Jesus enables us to do what we could not do on our own. But the yoke of Jesus comes with a weight that we're able to carry that we never even knew we were supposed to carry. We were living life carrying what we were able to do on our own. But Jesus comes along with his yoke, attaching it to burdens and things that we didn't know that we should be carrying, that he enables us to move. And now it's a provision. You see, that woman has two pots worth of water. She has a provision she could not do on her own because of the yoke that she carried. And now she has more provision for her family because she allowed to carry that yoke. It looks like you're adding more weight, but it's not adding more weight. It's not adding more burden. It's actually giving you more ability. And so people say, I'm not ready to be a Christian yet. I'm not ready to do that. No, no, you don't understand that if you don't think you're ready you need it more than you ever could have because you don't even see how jesus could be carrying the load for you in life that you think you're not able to deal with because people say i'm not ready to be a christian yet because what they're saying in their mind is i know what that would mean and i am not able to do it and jesus says Amen. You're not able to do it. But when you come to me, I give you a yoke and I carry the burden that you never could carry on your own. And I will enable you to come into a life you never could come into on your own. Let me show you here real quick in the scriptures right here. Jesus says, take my yoke. My yoke is comfortable. My burden is light. You see, there is nothing more uncomfortable than trying to make your way through this life without Jesus, without the Holy Ghost of God empowering you to live the good life. When you're single and stupid and you're running around thinking you're living the good life and then you get saved and you find a life partner and you're like, this is what I've always been looking for. This is the life that I've always wanted. Let me get the worship team to come up. We're going to share the Lord's table here in a second. And so Jesus said to me, come all who are weary and burdened. This is our world. Amen. This is the world that we live in. Weary and heavy burdened. Jesus says, take my yoke for my yoke is comfortable. My burden is light. And this is what Jesus is inviting us into this morning. This is the life in Christ that Jesus has for you. And I want to I want to invite you today to prepare your heart to receive the Lord's table that we can move into this place. But before we do, if you can get the lights for me, I want to pray. Father, we prepare our hearts. We prepare our hearts to receive the table of the Lord. Father, we we know, we know that you have a life for us that we could not live on our own. And we say we've tried to do it our way. We tried to be obedient under the law. We saw how you were shifting the goals, that we would have goals of love, 
But Lord, we want to move and live the life. The abundant life where we don't have to protect ourselves. We don't have to hoard. We don't have to compare ourselves to other people. We can simply look at you. As a writer said, all our fountains are in you, Jesus. All our love is in you. All our goals are in you. Father, I know today there are people in this room who are living on the treadmill of life. They feel like they're running and running and running and running, never quite grasping what they're after. Father, I know the frustration of that. I know the futility. I know the heartache. And Father, I know that you know this. I know that your son, Jesus, when he was on earth, experienced this as he was rejected, refuted, and repelled. by your spirit you fellowship with him in the same way father I pray right now that you would fellowship with those who are struggling today those who are hurting those who are really trying to move into a better season Lord we lay our hearts before you today We lay our lives before you and we say, whatever you want out of this life, you can have. Whatever you want to use in my life to reach the world, to tell them about you, to invite them, to invite them into this relationship with the living God. Whatever door you want to open for me, whatever room you want to put me in to tell people about you, I will walk through that door. I just want to live in your abundance. To know you in the fellowship of your spirit. Stand with me if you would. To practice an open table at Revival Life Church, what we're going to do is we're going to come forward and receive the elements. We're going to receive them all together back at your, back at your seat. But let us pray. Father, you said that we are to pray in your word, that we are to receive this rightly. If we don't discern the body rightly, then this is a problem. Have a communion. So here's what I want you to do. We're gonna, in a moment, we're going to come forward and receive the elements. But we're going to sing while we do that, and then we're going to receive it together. All right? What I'd like you to do is if you could come down the center aisle and then go back on the sides and we'll serve you with the elements now.